uh, and I was here before tea as well, um, so sorry, me again. Uh, thank you for asking me to talk about autoimmunity in type 1 diabetes. Uh, this is my declaration of interest, and you'll be relieved to hear it hasn't changed since about half an hour ago. So I'm going to talk about autoimmunity in type 1 diabetes, and I'll break it up into periods of time. So I'll think about before diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. We'll talk a little bit about screening for autoimmunity. Talk about autoimmunity at the point of diagnosis, what the genetic and other influences on that might be, and what in interventions we may have immediately after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes that may help to prevent or delay type 1 diabetes. So if we start before diagnosis, so as you all know, at the point of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, people have already lost the majority of their beta cells irreversibly to autoimmune destruction. But the disease course starts well before that, and this is the recognized nomenclature for how we describe type 1 diabetes. Uh, so there is pre-stage 1, where you have uh, variable genetic and environmental risks, but completely normal glucose and no evidence of autoimmunity. In stage 1, we see beta cell autoimmunity, but we have preserved normoglycemia and we have preserved uh, beta cell function. Stage two, we have beta cell autoimmunity with dysglycemia. So glucose has now become abnormal, and this is pre-symptomatic disease, so abnormal glucose but without symptoms. And then finally, at the point of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, we see stage three, which is beta cell autoimmunity, dysglycemia with symptoms. And we know that autoimmunity, therefore, precedes the diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, and that can be by many years. So these are data from Annette Ziegler in Germany, who's shown in countless different ways in lots of cohorts that the number of islet antibodies that are detected determines the rate of progression to type 1 diabetes. And this is in a cohort of children, uh, so up to the age of 20. And you can see that if you have no autoantibodies at the top light blue line that says none, then your chance of pr progressing to type 1 diabetes is zero, and the proportion of people without type 1 diabetes is 100%. But if you have three islet autoantibodies positive, your chance of progressing to type 1 diabetes is 100% within 20 years, and in fact, by 18 years, all of that cohort have type 1 diabetes. Living with one islet antibody and two islet antibodies gives you an intermediate risk but a continued progression towards stage 3 symptomatic dysglycemic type 1 diabetes. So there's clearly potential here to start looking for autoimmunity before we see type 1 diabetes, uh, and there is an argument that we should be screening for type 1 diabetes. Screening is controversial uh, and complicated. It's also expensive and requires population science, but it is in a research stage at the present for screening for type 1 diabetes. And obviously, if we can identify people at risk of developing type 1 diabetes by autoimmunity, then we can use interventions to prevent or delay the onset of type 1 diabetes with the aim, hopefully, of reducing the burden of self-management of type 1 diabetes and reducing mortality and morbidity associated with long-duration type 1 diabetes. At present, quite correctly, I think, the focus is only on prevention of DKA at diagnosis. So diabetic ketoacidosis is life-threatening, as you know. It's unpleasant, it's expensive, but it's also associated with immediate destruction of all remaining beta cells. DKA at presentation is associated with a lower probability of a honeymoon period of remission in type 1 diabetes and is associated with less detectable C-peptide throughout your time course living with type 1 diabetes. So preventing DKA at diagnosis is an important, potentially impactful intervention in itself, and there are multiple international active research programs looking at screening for autoimmunity of type 1 diabetes. These are Wilson and Jungner's principles of screening that you'll remember from medical school. Uh, obviously, I didn't, so I had to put them on this slide to remind me. Um, I won't go through them all, but I think there is an argument here that prevention of diabetic ketoacidosis fulfills most of these criteria. 
So it's certainly important. We certainly understand the natural history of the condition, and there's a, a recognizable early symptomatic stage of autoimmunity before DKA. We've got good tests for DKA and diagnostic criteria, and the test is acceptable to a population in that it's not complex, expensive, or invasive. There is an agreed policy on who to treat for DKA, it's everybody, and there's an acceptable treatment for this recognized condition, which is insulin. There's facilities for diagnosis and treatment, but I think the difficult thing here is who do we screen, how do we do it, and how much does it cost? Because I think the risk here is that we fail the economic argument for screening for type 1 diabetes, and the continuing process requirement uh, means that children and adults at risk would need to be screened very regularly. And of course, the other problem is that even if we do screen people at high risk, so siblings of people with type 1 diabetes, we're going to miss a significant proportion of people who have sporadic type 1 diabetes without a family history. So screening for autoimmunity may not be economically viable. I think there's a risk of what I would coin pre-diabetes distress. So if I told you that your child has three antibodies positive or one antibody positive, that gives you a very different probability of your child developing type 1 diabetes and a very different, different certainty in the future. But if you know that your child has an anti-insulin antibody, age 5, I'm not sure what you do with that information. You can screen again, you can check C-peptide again, but fundamentally, the important intervention is awareness of progression to type 1 diabetes. And that's equally true if your child has no antibodies, because they can develop antibodies de novo, and I'm not sure how we argue about screening every child every year, every two years, every three years, and how we argue the risk. That doing so in the general population will be very challenging, and targeted screening will miss those sporadic cases, as I've said. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to how we do it. So we can do very simple autoimmune screening, or we can do genetic population screening with autoimmune screening. And there are some pros and cons of those, principally cost and what we do with genetic information, as it can be complex to interpret. The other argument against screening is that we already know that we can prevent ketoacidosis with a cheap available intervention. These are data from the ADDRESS2 study, which we coordinated at Imperial College in London, and we recruit people with new-onset type 1 diabetes, and it's a registry study that enables recruitment to secondary intervention. But we've shown in this study that two factors associated with a reduced incidence of DKA at diagnosis of type 1 diabetes are having a parent living with diabetes or having a sibling living with diabetes. And what that tells us is that the best way to prevent the DKA is to be aware of the symptoms of diabetes. And there is a, a program in the UK called, run by Diabetes UK called the 4Ts that encourages people to be vigilant for tiredness, thirstiness, going to the toilet often, and losing weight and being thin. So the 4Ts, tired, thirsty, toilet, thin. Uh, and if, as a parent, you are vigilant for those 4Ts, you will detect early onset type 1 diabetes and enable prevention of DKA. So given that we have an effective, cheap uh, intervention to prevent DKA, do we need screening or do we need population awareness and education? So at diagnosis, the autoantibodies that we can measure to pancreatic beta cell components that may or may not be detectable are anti-GAD antibodies, anti-IA2 antibodies, anti-zinc transporter, uh, and then anti-tetraspanin-7, which has recently been described but is not routinely measured except in research, and anti-insulin antibodies. And I put anti-insulin antibodies in brackets because inevitably, when you are doing this test, people have been exposed to exogenous insulin. So when we do it in research, before the onset of type 1 diabetes, we can measure anti-insulin antibodies in insulin-naive people, but in people who have been exposed to exogenous insulin, anti-insulin antibodies may be a consequence of exposure to exogenous insulin rather than an exogenous, endogenous part of the disease pathology. These are helpful for, for differentiation of diabetes subtype at diagnosis, 
if you see someone who has two antibodies positive, you can be really confident that what you're seeing is type 1 diabetes, independently of obesity and age. I was always told at medical school that people with type 1 diabetes were lean and young. People with type 2 diabetes were older and more likely to be overweight and obese. And over the course of the last 20 years specializing in, in diabetes, the most important thing I've learned is that that is nonsense. We see lean, young people with type 2 diabetes. We see overweight, older people with type 1 diabetes. And it's important to differentiate subtype so you can risk stratify and ensure people get the right education, support, and treatment from the point of diagnosis. So what is the pattern of antibodies that we see? So these, again, are data from the ADDRESS2 study from several thousand people shortly after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes in the United Kingdom. It's a multi-ethnic cohort relatively for type 1 diabetes in that it's only about 85% white European and 15% combination of South Asian, uh, Black African Caribbean and other ethnicities. I think the really important thing to pull out here, if you look at the cross-hatched greater than one or more antibody positive, is that throughout all of the age groups up to over 50, most people have more than one antibody at diagnosis. Second thing to notice is that children up to the age of 16 tend to be more likely to be anti-IA2 positive than anti-GAD positive, and adults tend to be more likely to be anti-GAD positive than anti-IA2 positive. So if you're going to selectively measure one antibody, I would measure IA2 in children, and I would measure GAD in adults, and if they are negative, you can reflex onto adding the other of the two there. But if you get to that point and they're antibody negative, you can be reasonably confident that they are an antibody negative new onset diabetes, it is very rare for people to be zinc transporter antibody alone positive. So GAD in adults, IA2 in children, if they're negative, do the other one and stop there would be my advice based on the data. But where do these antibodies come from? One of the hypotheses for the etiology of type 1 diabetes has been viral exposure, uh, and very recently these data were published in, the La in Lancet Diabetes, uh, and these are two forest plots that hopefully project reasonably well. The one on the left shows you uh, the exposure to enteroviruses in people with islet autoimmunity and shows very nicely that you're more likely to have higher enterovirus exposure if you have islet autoimmunity. So islet autoimmunity is associated with enterovirus exposure in people with type 1 diabetes. And on the right, you've got type 1 diabetes itself, and that shows very nicely with a much greater odds ratio that actually you're 16 times more likely to have higher enterovirus exposure if you have type 1 diabetes. So there is a clear association between enterovirus exposure, islet autoimmunity, and progression to type 1 diabetes. And the authors of this paper argue that this is a very good case for enteroviral vaccination in people at risk. I'm not sure that that is necessarily effective, but it's an interesting hypothesis and certainly worth trying. If we were to do that, who would have the vaccine? Do we give it to everyone or do we just give it to people with a pre-established risk? And if we do, is that based on genetic risk? So you're all familiar with HLA and its impact on autoimmunity, and these data show very nicely the impact of HLA polymorphisms on your odds ratio for developing type 1 diabetes. The blue protective DR15 DQ6 is shown by age group underneath the, uh, flat, the, underneath the line for zero and shows that they're significantly protective at all age groups against type 1 diabetes. And above the line, we have the red high-risk alleles, DR3, DQ2, DR4, DQ8, uh, compared to a neutral risk allele. And they show, as you know, that they are significantly associated with developing type 1 diabetes. Is HLA the only genetic locus that's important for type 1 diabetes? Well, the answer to that is no, but... This is the Manhattan plot for, the, for uh, a whole genome association with incident type 1 diabetes, and you can see that HLA absolutely dominates the genetic risk. There are other signals that you probably just about see above the dotted line at the bottom across the, the genome-wide association, 
but the very large association is indeed with HLA class 2. And what we have are polygenic risk scores that take that into account with weighting and give us a probability of genetic risk for type 1 diabetes. If we look again in our address 2 cohort at what that means in terms of childhood onset type 1 diabetes, adult onset type 1 diabetes, and type 2 diabetes, you can see that children with type 1 diabetes, regardless of whether they are antibody positive or negative at diagnosis, have a high genetic risk score for type 1 diabetes. Adults who, are, who have positive autoantibodies at diagnosis have a very similar high genetic risk score, but antibody negative adults with type 1 diabetes have a lower genetic risk, risk score, perhaps reflecting a complex type 1, type 2 combination uh, phenotype that we don't yet understand. And their genetic risk score is much more similar to that of people living with type 2 diabetes, which is significantly lower, as you'd expect. If we look at that in more detail and look at the relative, com com relative contributions of the HLA genetic risk score on the y-axis and the non-HLA genetic risk score here on the x-axis, you can see that antibody negative and positive children, the open and closed red circles on the top right, uh, confer very similar HLA and non-HLA risk for, for type 1 diabetes. And it's the same for autoantibody positive adults. They have a very high non-HLA and HLA genetic risk. But antibody negative adults have a lower HLA and non-HLA risk, suggesting they are indeed an intermediate phenotype. And that's partly contributed by HLA and non-HLA genes. Uh, and I think that's a really interesting phenotype that we need to look more closely at. So what are our choices for interventions? So that lots of them have been uh, explored over the last 10, 15 years or so, including antigen therapy of oral insulin and GAD, uh, so using glutamic acid decarboxylase as a, as a desensitizing antigen. Immunotherapies of rituximab, otoluxazumab, ustekinumab, and tepluzumab have all been used. Antithymocyte globulin, usually used in transplant, has been used. Uh, Verapamil is very interesting, and people have explored whether there are adjuncts that we already have available to us that are safe and well tolerated, and whether these can support interventions to uh, delay or prevent type 1 diabetes. In the interest of time, I'll only talk really about teplizumab and some of the adjuncts. So teplizumab is an anti-CD3 monoclonal, and you can see here from data that are now 10 years old, that if given immediately after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, you have increased C-peptide, uh, shown there in the black bars compared to the white bars in figure A in the top left, uh, and with a percentage change in C-peptide underneath that, and there is a significant preservation of C-peptide with teplizumab. There's lower insulin use, as you can see from the figure in the top right there, but despite those two effects of increased C-peptide and lower insulin use, the HbA1c was the same in the control group and the teplizumab group, and teplizumab reassuringly was well tolerated, though there is a uh, consistent signal of lymphopenia. This is a landmark randomized controlled trial of teplizumab in relatives at risk of type 1 diabetes. So these are people at stage 1 or stage 2 who have autoimmunity but not type 1 diabetes, and you can see that teplizumab delays the onset of type 1 diabetes. The median time to diagnosis of type 1 diabetes with teplizumab is four years, 48 months, whereas it was only two years with placebo in autoantibody positive re relatives of people living with type 1 diabetes. And in an extension phase of the same study, this treatment effect persisted beyond 72 months, suggesting that teplizumab is promising to delay but not prevent type 1 diabetes in people at highest risk. The problem, of course, is that teplizumab is frighteningly expensive, costing over $200,000 for one treatment, something that is not affordable in any healthcare system. Verapamil, on the contrary, is very affordable. It's a cheap, safe, generic drug that's been used for many years in cardiology. These are data showing the use of verapamil immediately after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes and show a statistically significant effect on area under the curve for C-peptide. This is biologically plausible. As you know, insulin secretion is partly dependent on calcium influx uh, within the beta cell depolarization. So while this effect may not be clinically important, 
verapamil is a cheap, safe, and potentially effective adjunct to other immunotherapies. This is a study, uh, a forearm randomized control study uh, of the anti-IL-21 uh, monoclonal antibody in combination with liraglutide on its own, against liraglutide alone, and against placebo. And you can see that these are data for the C-peptide area under the curve over 54 weeks after administration, shortly after diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. Both the IL anti-IL-21 monoclonal in combination and alone has an impact on C-peptide, but liraglutide doesn't. And you can suggest here that the liraglutide doesn't really add anything to the anti-IL-21 on its own, though liraglutide and GLP-1 receptor agonists have been proposed uh, as adjuncts to immunotherapy. Finally, I'll, look, I'll tell you about hybrid closed loop used new, after new onset type 1 diabetes in children. These are data from Roman Havorka's cloud study, which randomized children to either use hybrid closed loop or control uh, after diagnosis. And you can see that there is no difference in the geometric mean of C peptide uh, following out to two years after diagnosis. However, there's also no difference here uh, in HbA1c between the control group and the closed loop group, but I draw your eye to what the median overall control is in the closed loop group shortly after diagnosis in children with new onset type 1 diabetes. The mean HbA1c is around 48 to 50 millimoles per mole, which is around 6.5 to 6.7 percent. This means that actually, immediately after diagnosis with technology in a variable age group, we're able to achieve near normal glycemia and we're able to do so within three months of diagnosis and that persists well beyond the period of time where we would normally expect the honeymoon period. So I would ask the question whether delaying for a year or two is actually an important outcome when we have a safe, effective treatment that can normalize glucose with minimal burden. So in summary, autoimmunity may be helpful to identify people at risk of type 1 diabetes, and screening may identify risk, but there is no, no intervention at the moment, and there is potential for harm. Prevention of DKA is already possible with education and awareness, and should be a priority, and novel interventions to prevent type 1 diabetes are lacking at the moment. Delaying type 1 diabetes may be feasible with teplizumab, and the adjuncts of verapamil, GLP-1 receptors, and closed-loop therapy may improve effectiveness of immunotherapy, but the long-term safety needs to be shown. Thank you.